civilian role, Mr. Matt Harvey. Good morning. Good morning. Joining us too, gentlemen. Great to have you with us. I got a text from uh, Honest Donna. She said, now she needs to know what brand of hydrogen water that you're drinking. The light show has really turned her on to this. I um, will have to get back to her on that. I, I don't know. I'll have to look at the brand of the the brand of the container. Yeah, with the blue light and everything that the water was. We could see the water bubbles floating. I tell you what, I will. I will check. You look it up. I will look it up, and then I'll get back to her at the next. Much at the top of the hour. The Teaser. Ber- the Berkeley County Youth uh, Fair continues, by the way, throughout the weekend uh, and Saturday. Uh, as well and at the youth fair you can uh, check out uh, on many times during an election season uh, the political parties including this year the libertarian party we met the candidate for governor in west virginia from the libertarian party yesterday uh, erica kolenich uh, she was with us uh, yesterday and uh, we've talked to her many times by phone that was the first time we'd had a chance to talk with her uh, in studio. It was a very nice surprise. Uh, via telephone right now, the Libertarian vice presidential candidate, uh, candidate Mike Termott, joins us via telephone. Mike, good morning to you, sir. Good morning. It's a great pleasure to be with you, Rob, and uh, good for you for having Erica on. She is terrific, isn't she? Absolutely. I have always enjoyed our conversations with her uh, in the past, and we've had her on. I think we've talked with her three, four times over the last couple of years. Uh, Mike, where are you this morning physically located? I am in uh, Virginia, not so far from you, but I look forward to being in your neck of the woods on Saturday at the at the Berkeley Fair that you were mentioning. Indeed, it's a terrific program. Yeah, Mike, how long have you been a libertarian? I've been a registered libertarian since about 2011, when I around the time I started my second career as a police officer. But I've probably, like most Americans, been a libertarian at heart most of my life. Yeah, tell tell us about your career. You mentioned the, the police officer part of it. Take us through the path of what uh, brought you to this point in your life. Sure. I, I had grown up a bit of a Republican. I grew up in the financial services business and commercial finance and banking. Went back to graduate school in Washington, D.C. at the George Washington University studied economics. I've taught economics at three different universities. I worked for the White House for a couple of years as an economist, had my own business educating financial services executives and providing strategic consulting, and was a longtime advocate in Washington uh, to the legislature for greater competition and a deregulated environment in financial services industries. And so I have spent a long time believing that the economy would work better if we would let people make decisions for themselves. And that is an integral component of of libertarianism. Mike, in regards to becoming the vice president uh, candidate uh, with the Libertarian Party, uh, how did that work out for you in, in terms of being selected? Uh, It was a good experience. We have an open convention, as you may know. It's a little bit different from what the Republicans and Democrats do, who have their candidates selected long before they ever get to the convention. We had an open convention. Chase Oliver was chosen as our presidential nominee. Chase is a great guy, a young man who has been a longtime peace activist. Some of your listeners may recognize Chase Oliver's name from the Senate campaign in Georgia, where he was the guy who forced a runoff between Herschel Walker and Raphael Warnock because uh, Chase got a few percentage points and prevented them from getting 50 percent. So they had to do the whole thing over again, which gained us some notoriety and got people to sit up in their chairs and take us a little bit more seriously in Georgia. And that's the kind of thing that we need to get our message out so that people like Erica Kalenich don't have to spend their time explaining libertarianism. She can talk about her own campaign. And we have Chase on the program, by the way, August the 19th. That's a Monday morning at 8.05. He'll be a scheduled guest. When you talk with conservative Republicans, many of them will say that they have a bit of a libertarian streak in them. What is it that takes a person from, I've got some libertarian in me as a Republican, to I'm done with the Republican Party, now I'm officially a libertarian? For me, that's a really interesting question. Good for you. For me, it was realizing that the Republican Party is no longer fiscally conservative. Uh, I was a part of the George Herbert Walker Bush administration, which is the 
the administration during which the president had famously gone back on his read my lips, no new taxes pledge and felt that he had to succumb to political pressure. Libertarians don't put up with political pressure as an excuse to make decisions like that. That was a big turning point. And I think that it's true that, you know, libertarians are really dedicated to their principles, and those include a deregulated environment, uh, free trade, free markets, and you have to admit, as much as we all have loved the Republican Party at some point in our lives, the party has gone in a weird direction on these issues and no longer stands up for those particular policy issues. John Gilstrap. So when you talk about um, a deregulated environment, just cherry picking here, those are easy words to say, but some regulations we kind of need. We, we want to have good roads, right? We want to have buildings that stand up over time. So what, what regulations do we unregulate? At the federal level, you want to deregulate everything because there's no reason for the federal government to be involved in doing this. The, that responsibility should be spun out to the states, by the way. So, for example, what you would want is to make as much federal regulation as possible subject to the approval of individual governors. And you would want pressure on the legislature at the federal level to detail what regulations they really do want, rather than just allowing agencies to fill in the gaps and make up regulations as they go along. Because as we know, the, the swamp, as so many politicians refer to it, the federal bureaucracy makes up regulations without a lot of legislative backing. And this is what drives people crazy, is that the rules are always getting thicker, heavier, longer, they're being re-specified from day to day, and it's hard to keep up. We believe that states are the appropriate agencies to uh, institute regulations. As a libertarian, I wish that there were a heck of a lot less in terms of regulations. I think that people are better off making decisions for their own businesses and for their own lives. But to the extent to which we have to tolerate an agency making decisions at all, we wish that we were as close to the end user as possible. But we don't want the gauge of railroad tracks to change when you go from West Virginia into Ohio, right? I mean, we we got to have we got to have regulations has, to cross has straight that lines. Been, has has that been a challenge lately? No, I mean, you just you just say you want to you you want to eliminate federal regulations and put it onto the states. That's that's right. The reason railroad tracks work has nothing to do with the federal government, as you may know. It's a uh, coordination among private sector institutions and. Uh, as many of your listeners may know or may not know, the vast majority of what we might call cooperation, regulation, coordination happens in the private sector now. You brought up a really interesting example. It's not because of the federal government, the railroad tracks work crossing state lines. It's because of private sector organizations communicating among each other. And that's the sort of thing that we would need more of in an economy in which the federal government stood down and let people make decisions for themselves. What about occupational exposures to chemicals and that kind of thing? I think that we want the courts to work better than they do now. We have too many instances where governments give a free pass to organizations for the liability associated with, for example, chemicals. Uh, another big example that your listeners may be familiar with is that the federal government gives a pass on liability to pharmaceutical companies who develop vaccines. Therefore, these companies develop drugs, medicines, especially vaccines, without sufficient testing and without regard for the costs of the side effects of the drugs that they develop. We want courts to do their job holding companies accountable rather than the government deciding just as a blanket fashion, that these companies should not be held accountable by court-sanctioned liability. But at the, I'm being deliberately provocative here, but in the Sorry. in the workplace environment, um, you don't want, left to their own devices, I was in the occupational safety and health business for a long time, and left to their own devices, many employers would, are perfectly happy letting their employees work in clouds of sulfur dioxide and and or or 
you know, without any machine guards, without any guards on machines, uh, without an enforcement mechanism. Now, whether it's a, a state OSHA, for lack of a better term, a, a state safety and health agency or a federal state safety and health agency, I think that's worth arguing. But you have to have some level of regulation, don't you? I don't, not in the way that you use the word regulation, absolutely not. In terms of uh, some form of regulation, certainly. This has been the modern role of unions. I, too, have worked in this space. Unions typically do a pretty good job of negotiating for the details of a workspace environment that really makes sense. We have undermined the efficacy of unions doing their job when we have you know government agencies coming in and making these rules that don't work for anybody that doesn't mean that the state has zero role to the extent to which unions are unable to play the role that we want them to there are circumstances when we want either uh, a community agency or coordination across private sector organizations to play a role none of that argues that the federal government should be involved there is no economic or logical or industrial reason why the federal government has a role to play here. In turn, in, I don't know other than to say you're wrong. I mean, there's, uh, there, when it comes to environmental regulations, and I, I absolutely agree that there's overreach and that we, we regulate to ridiculous amounts on ridiculous things. But um, we have clean drinking water now, much cleaner drinking water now, uh, because we have federal regulations that the, the water that is produced in one state that, that runs to the state next door and then ultimately down into the Gulf of Mexico or into the Atlantic Ocean, all of that has to be regulated to the same level. Otherwise, we don't have the clean drinking water. And you can only do that with federal regulation. To take that away, to have Mississippi have different regulations than, than Louisiana, would be lunacy. It just wouldn't work. No, I'm sorry, this is not true. I mean, there's no factual basis to make such a statement. It is true that certain states have done a crummy job of regulating their environmental, uh, the, the, the water uh, clarity, for example, uh, runoff from farms. It is true that you can find examples of states that have done crummy jobs, but the fact that somebody does a crummy job doesn't mean that, you know, automatically someone else would do a better job. It is true that the federal government did a good job with regard to, for example, uh, the Chesapeake Bay, where I live, but there's no reason to believe that over time states can't perform that function. Indeed, some of the most important uh, environmental regulation where we live around the Chesapeake comes from the states. It, does, it doesn't come from the federal government. We were all frustrated that the federal government did a crappy job for generations and generations and generations. And when it finally came in with the Clean Water Act, it did a crappy job instituting that. It, it, I appreciate the fact that, that you view the federal regulatory environment that has cleaned up water as a success, but there's just no economic or logical or industrial reason to believe that that has to happen at the national level instead of the state level. It's just not true. States have telephones and can coordinate with each other and do every day. But they didn't. In all kinds of industries. History, history is, is not on your side here. In, until, I mean, RECRA was, was, became effective in 1976, I think, somewhere in, in that sleeve of time. And until the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act was passed, the, the hazardous waste was not even hazardous. I work for a company where it was perfectly legal to toss whatever it was you wanted to toss out into the backyard, whether it's paint thinner or, in one case, nerve agent. Um, it, it was perfectly legitimate and legal just to toss it on the ground. There was no law that says you couldn't do it. Now, the state could have said that that's illegal, but they didn't. So it took federal regulation to say that not only was it illegal, but now you have to clean it up. Without that federal regulation, it would still be there. So, I mean, it's just, history's not on your side here. That's, uh... Well, it, history suggests that people drop the ball in terms of forcing these companies to internalize these costs. 
the courts didn't do a good job. Local prosecutors didn't do a good job. There weren't local businesses that brought cases and achieved standing in court to, to do a good job. But these are all means by which it could have happened. I don't think it's really fair to point to one level of, uh, of a regulator and say, well, they screwed up, and therefore here's the only solution available. That, that, that doesn't hold water either, does it? It, it, it wasn't one. It was the United States. It was the industrial United States. I'm not suggesting that people were trying to hurt anything. I'm just suggesting they didn't have to not hurt anything. Let's go to Matt Harvey now. I think we've <laughs> butted up against a brick wall on this one. Go ahead, Matt. Uh, Mr. Termott, uh, the Libertarian Party uh, has a... Can you explain its stance on, on drug use? As, as a prosecutor, I find this interesting. Sure. As a police officer and as a Libertarian, I recognize that the war on drugs hasn't worked. We have dozens of thousands of individuals who succumb to addiction in the United States, winding up in a death toll that has reached well over 100,000 in any particular year. And I believe that we need to approach our drug problem in a fundamentally different way. It doesn't work to criminalize the use of drugs or the possession of drugs in terms of getting people the medical help that they need, in terms of preventing addiction in terms of preventing death it just as a practical matter doesn't work it is also true that as a libertarian i believe that it's not an ethical proposition for any government at the state level or the federal level to tell people what it is they can or cannot do with their with their bodies uh, I, I think that that's a, a logical gap that is just hard for anyone to to cover there's just you know, no logical reason to say, well, a, a government should have the moral authority to tell anybody what it is that they can or cannot do. But setting that all aside, as a prosecutor, you have to admit you have seen our society develop in a way that has not made people safer, has not helped people stay away from drugs just because of criminalization. Um. The Libertarian Party, there's a there's a lot of um, there's a lot of friction between the Democrats and the Republican parties right now, and a lot of Americans um, are turned off by that. Uh, is this an opportunity this year for the Libertarian Party to make strides in, in gaining more members and becoming a bigger voting bloc? I think so, absolutely. Uh, in fact, there's been polls out that suggest that we're polling in the uh, range of 4% uh, in in many places and, and higher than that in, in some places. It is in part because of the friction between the parties, but it's also because people are feeling disaffected by the Republican Party and disaffected by the uh, by the Democratic Party. These parties no longer adhere to the political agenda of their past. Most of the people in my family joined the Democratic Party many years ago, believing it would be a party that would stand up for peace over military interventionism, that would stand up for a, a, a real absolutist position on the First Amendment, that would stand against the government censoring what it is that people say online, for example. The Democratic Party and a lot of people who joined that party for those reasons, they have gone in two really different directions. And as I pointed out earlier, the same thing for the Republican Party. So I think that there's a lot of people who are frustrated, yes, by the tensions between the two parties, but also the fact that the parties no longer represent the principles that they used to. What's going to, what's it going to take for libertarians to break through and have a major electoral victory? I think it will take uh, a recognition that the Republican Party and the Democratic Party are not representing Americans' values. I think that there will be a, a fair number of stark examples in our future. One is likely, unfortunately, to be a financial uh, disaster at the federal government level. I think that most economists who pay any attention to this recognize that our federal government cannot last on the path that's on past the middle of this century. I believe that it will face the beginning of a financial collapse well before that. 
And at that point, it's going to be very, very difficult for a Republican or a Democrat to say we're on your side in terms of preventing this, because they are the ones that have contributed to the federal government spending so much money, raising so much debt, contributing to so much inflation and taxes that are so high, and have just not lifted a a single finger to avoid that disaster. The other big example, which I worry about very much, is that both of these parties have become enamored of military interventions around the world, foreign aid, uh, saber-rattling in every theater possible, pursuing a foreign policy that has not made us safer, that has made us less safe. And I worry that there will at some point become a major conflict that the United States government has a hard time getting us out of. And at that point, again, it's going to be very, very difficult for Republican or Democrat to make the case that they have helped avoid that. Mike Termot is our guest here. He's the vice presidential nominee for the Libertarian Party. And uh, we'll talk with our presidential nominee, uh, Chase Oliver, by the way, on August the 16th. You mentioned the national debt, and I looked these numbers up uh, a few months ago, and it's uh, pretty startling, by the way. Uh, Most Republicans think that Joe Biden has been the worst economic disaster to ever take the White House. And the debt under Joe Biden has grown to $35 trillion. When he took it over, it was at uh, $28.4 trillion. So he's, he's added more than 20% to the debt. And most Republicans think that Donald Trump had a brilliant four years and it was economic bliss when he was the president. Uh, Donald Trump added 40% to the national debt. It grew from 2020 uh, to 28.4 uh, um, in, in, in debt, a trillion dollars in debt during his time. So that was $8.2 trillion that he added to the debt. So Mike's point that Republicans and Democrats are really more alike than they are different, depending on you know, your perspective on who's your favorite guy is really who you think the other one is uh, worse than. But Trump's numbers are worse than Biden's when it comes to adding to the national debt. Uh, Mike, I've got 60 seconds left. Uh, tell people they can find out more about your campaign and the Libertarian Party. I appreciate that. First of all, people should be checking out Erica Kolenich. Her website is terrific, a lot of fun. She's for school choice and a deregulated pro-growth economy. You can find out more about me if you can find your way to MikeTremont.com, which is tricky to spell because there's two A's in Tremont. You can go to VoteChaseOliver.com, a little bit easier to spell. And uh, look, I'll be out at the Berkeley Youth Fair It's going to be a lot of fun, and if your listeners want to come out for a a good time and a handshake and to talk about politics, I'd welcome the opportunity to meet with them. Mike, thanks. I appreciate your time this morning and your spirited discussion here with uh, Mr. Gilstrap, who is a uh, retired safety engineer. He's a terrific guy, and so are all your (laughs) listeners. Thanks for the opportunity to speak with you. Have a good day, sir. Have a great day. You too.